we still got a minute, but uh, I guess we'll start early. All right. Thank you for joining us today. This is our third and final presentation, and we have Hadeh. Thank you, Dr. Benavides. Uh, I'm Garrett Trahern, and we are Team Ascension. Today we are giving you our preliminary design review of our High Altitude Deployment System, also known as Hades. Quick overview, I will talk about our design team structure and then introduce Hades to you. I will cover the system objectives as well as the design structure tree and our concept of operations. We will then speak to you about our system definition. Each of our subsystems will present to you on our numerical validation. We will then conclude with some system validation as well as programmatics. Going over the design team structure, I am Garrett Trahern, as I stated. I'm the project manager. With me are my uh, team leads, which are Joshua Shainer for our propulsion subsystem, Matthew Biss for our payload subsystem, Jessica Tercios for our electronic subsystem, and our assistant project manager, Andrew Burke, who is head of our structures and integration team. Moving on to the system objectives, the platform should be capable of deploying five payloads from an altitude that is greater than 100 meters. Uh, moving on to objectives two and three, once the platform reaches that altitude, it should be capable of loitering there with or without deploying our payloads. Upon returning to the ground, it must be capable of landing safely with or without deploying the payloads. And next, each payload should collect acceleration data during the mission. Also relating to the payloads are our next set of requirements, which are the payloads should, uh, excuse me, collectively record air temperature, air pressure, and video data. Next, the mass of each payload should be less than two kilograms. Each payload should also be capable of landing safely with or without being deployed from our platform. And the duration of the mission should be greater than 20 minutes. Finally, the platform should be capable of communicating with our ground station at all times. Going over our design structure tree, as I stated before, our Hades consists of four subsystems, those subsystems being propulsion, structures, electronics, and payloads. Going into a little bit more depth for here, uh, this slide shows some of the components for each subsystem. I would first like to talk to you about the propulsion and electronics subsystems. The electronic speed controller and motor components of the propulsion subsystem will utilize the power component of the electronic subsystem to provide the necessary torque to our propellers, which will allow us to provide the thrust for our system. Next, the attitude and communication components of the electronic subsystem will allow us to maintain steady flight during the duration of a mission, as well as communicate with our platform at all times. Next, I'd like to speak on the structures and payload subsystems, starting with the leg and ring components of our structure subsystem. This provides the external frame for our system, which will prevent the payloads from interacting with the ground in the case that we do not deploy them once at altitude. Speaking of our payloads, we have two payload configurations, uh, one and two. This is the video and non-video configurations. This comprises our payload subsystem, which is then attached to our payloads bar, which is part of our structure subsystem. Finally, we have the electronics bar, which supports the batteries, as well as all of our other flight hardware that we will be utilizing for our mission. With all subsystems operational, Hades will be able to complete a successful mission. Here's a rendering of our system concept. Uh, as you can see here, we also have a mock-up located uh, right next to me. Um, the rendering here is located at the RC field here at Every Riddle. This is our intended launch location for our platform. Going into a little bit more detail on our concept of operations, uh, this is a graphic that shows you our um, intended operational areas. The red circle represents the operational cylinder. They say cylinder measuring 25 meters in radius and 120 meters in height. This is the volume that the platform will not exit during the duration of a mission. The yellow circle represents our safety cylinder, which is a cylinder measuring 50 meters in radius. This is the area that no personnel will enter once the platform is powered and operational. Next, we have the blue circle, which represents the deployment cylinder. This is a cylinder measuring 250 meters in radius, and this is the area that no payloads will leave once they are deployed from the platform. You can see that there is a green line on this image, as well as a small gray one. Moving on to a little better view of that, you can see that the gray line represents the flight path of the platform. Since it is controlled, it stays within the operational cylinder of the platform. 
The green line representing the flight path of the payloads, however, are not controlled once they are deployed from the system. And since this simulation was run in MATLAB with a nine meter per second wind speed in the southeast direction, it actually causes the payloads to drift outside of our safety cylinder. Now this does not constitute mission failure as they remain within the deployment area. Next, I'd like to show you a short animation of our concept of operations. The platform will start from its ground station where it will power up and then ascend to an altitude <laughs> between 100 and 120 meters. It will then loiter for a duration of time that is approximately 19 minutes once it reaches that altitude. After it reaches its loiter period, it will deploy the five payloads in 10 second intervals. And the payloads will then slowly descend back down to the ground via the use of parachutes as shown here. Finally, at the very end of our concept of operations, the platform will descend back to the ground station safely. I'd now like to pass it off to Andrew Burr for our system definition. Thank you, Gary. As mentioned, my name is Andrew Burr, and I'm the assistant project manager for Team Ascension. Today, I'll be going over the system definition. As the assistant project manager, I am also the integration team lead. The other members of this team include Jessica Jansen, Adam Case, and Samantha Watson. Shown here is our full design. It's pictured in four different colors, each corresponding to a different subsystem. Shown in gray is a structured subsystem. This is responsible for ensuring the platform is capable of withstanding the loads which it will be under, while also providing a place for each of the other subsystems to sit. Shown in blue is the propulsion subsystem. Seen here on our mock-up, it's placed along the outer <laughs> rim of the structure. This subsystem is responsible for generating lift so that the platform will ascend to altitude, loiter, and descend safely. It's connected to the outer ring using a bolted metal plate which is welded to the outer ring. The electronic subsystem placed in the middle of our mock-up here, shown in red on our slide, is responsible for providing power to the platform as well as attitude control. It's connected to the structure using metal Z-vent clamps. Now looking a little closer at the connection point between the payloads and the structure, we'll see that the payloads are supported by an orange nylon string. This string will eventually be severed using a hot nichrome wire. Once the string is severed, the payloads will deploy. Now I'd like to introduce Joshua Shainer to describe the propulsion subsystem definition. Hello everyone, my name is Joshua Shainer and I'm the propulsion subsystem lead and I'll be discussing our subsystem definition. Uh, also on the propulsion subsystem is Matthew Boyle, who will be coming up in just a few minutes to discuss our numerical validation. Now for our subsystem, we only had one requirement and that is that we shall generate a thrust magnitude that is greater than or equal to 264.6 newtons worth of thrust. Now this was generated with two ideas in mind, is that a thrust to weight ratio of 1.5 generated from uh, research into existing systems as well as being able to uh, uh, establish a certain amount of control to be able to control the entire system as well as a maximum payload mass of 18 kilograms which was derived from early design iterations as well as research into existing systems. As you can see again from both our mock-up and the system level image right here, that we have decided on a radial hexacopter configuration with six propellers providing thrust through the entire system, which will be operating in three counter-rotating pairs. Now, if we zoom in on just one of these locations, you can see the motor and propeller pair, the propeller being an 18 inch diameter by five and a half inch pitch carbon fiber blade attached to a brushless DC motor, these brushless DC motors are E-Flight Power 60B outrunner motors, which will be attached to the ring as Andrew described. Uh, looking at the box beneath each of the motor locations, the box beneath each of those locations will control or contain our electronic speed controller or ESC, 
which we are using at Phoenix Edge 100 amp ESCs. Both the E-Flight Power 60B motors and the 100 amp ESCs were supplied by the College of Engineering through Mr. Patrick David uh, from a uh, previous stock on a old capstone project. Now I would like to pass it off to Matthew Boyle, who will be discussing our numerical validation. Thank you, Joshua. Once again, my name is Matthew Boyle, and I will be discussing the propulsion subsystem numerical validation. Now, first up, the propulsion subsystem only used one design metric, and that was the, that we investigated the total maximum thrust that we would be capable of producing for the entire system. Now, to do this, first we needed to find the um, we needed to find the, the electrical power, excuse me, that was available to us. This was done using the equation towards the top of the slide, where P sub E is the electrical power, I is the current, and V is the nominal voltage. Now the current that we used was 65 amps, since that is the maximum continuous amperage that our motors can run at. We then converted this electrical power into mechanical power by dividing by a factor of safety of 1.1, as shown in the equation towards the bottom of the slide, where P sub M is the mechanical power. With the mechanical power known, we are then capable of calculating the rotational frequency of each of our propellers. This was done with the equation shown at the top of the slide, where n is the revolutions per second, p sub m, once again, is the mechanical power, c sub p is the coefficient of power, rho is the density, and d is the diameter of the propeller. With the rotational frequency known, we were then able to calculate the thrust that we would be, would be able to produce per propeller. This was done using the equation towards the top of the slide, where capital T is the thrust per propeller, C sub T is the coefficient of thrust, rho is the density of the air, N is the revolutions per second, and D, once again, is the diameter of the propeller. Since we have six propellers, we then multiplied this number by six to get a total system thrust of 418.9 newtons. Now, this is much greater than our required 264.6 newtons because for a vast duration of our mission, we will only need a thrust to weight ratio of one. And it is much more power efficient to spin a larger propeller uh, slower as opposed to a smaller propeller faster. So although we do not necessarily need all this required thrust or all this thrust that we are able to produce, it will uh, elongate the time that we could, or the time of our flight. With that, I would now like to introduce uh, Jessica Tercios to talk about the electronic subsystem definition. Thank you, Matt. My name is Jessica Tercios. I am the electronic subsystem team lead. Today, I will be discussing the electronic subsystem definition. On the electronics team with me are Jeffrey Hughes and Eugene Kim. The requirements for the electronic subsystem were as follows. The electronic subsystem must shall have a minimum capacity of 37.75 amp hours. This was determined as the amount of power needed to complete a 20 minute mission without deploying the payloads. The electronic subsystem shall maintain a platform pitch and roll within a range of plus or minus 32 degrees. This was determined as the maximum angle that the platform can pitch or roll to while maintaining vertical flight. The electronic subsystem shall communicate over a range of up to 212 meters. This was determined as the maximum distance between the platform and the mission control station with the platform at the top at the highest altitude it can reach within the operational cylinder and the mission control station outside of the safety cylinder. The electronic subsystem shall not be discharged below 80% of each battery's total capacity. This is due to the type of battery that we will be using. With lithium polymer batteries, if, it is, if they are discharged below 80% of their total capacity, the battery could be damaged and the lifetime of the battery could be reduced. Moving on to a visual overview of the electronic subsystem. As you can see, highlighted in the red box is where the electronic components will be located. It can also be seen on our mock-up located on the electronics rail. Each battery will be located on top of a tray, which will be, and each battery will be clamped to the platform using cable clamps. Located on top of the batteries will be the rest of the electronic components located in a different tray. 
Here are the individual components that make up the electronic subsystem. We'll be using a PixHawk flight controller to control the attitude of the platform <coughs> by sending commands to the ESCs which control the motors. We'll be using a GPS sensor to better determine our position throughout the mission. We'll be using a, an Arduino Uno microcontroller for payload deployment. Here we have the platform transceiver, which will be used during autonomous flight, and the manual control receiver, which will be used for communications during manual flight. On the bottom are the batteries we will be using. We will be using three 16 amp hour lithium polymer batteries. Here is a diagram showing how each of these components will be connected. As you can see, each battery will be connected to two ESCs, which will then be connected to one DC motor. Each ESC will also be connected to the flight controller so that they can get commands from the flight controller. Also connected to the flight controller will be the GPS, the transceiver, and the receiver, as well as the microcontroller, which will also be connected to the switches to control payload deployment. I would now like to invite Jeffrey Hughes to discuss the electronic subsystem numerical validation. Thank you, Jessica. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Hughes, and I will be covering the electronic subsystem numerical validation. We used four different design metrics in order to numerically validate the subsystem. We used battery capacity, battery depth of discharge, roll and pitch angle, and communication range. For our battery capacity analysis, we summed the products of all the individual platform parts uh, amperage requirements with the runtime that each part ran at to find our required battery capacity. Using our simulation, we calculated 37.75 amp hours as our required battery capacity. Using the lower equation shown here, we calculated our actual battery capacity. Since we are using three 16 amp hour lithium polymer batteries, we have an actual battery capacity of 48 amp hours. Since it is over this requirement, we find this requirement to be numerically valid. Our battery depth of discharge requirement, using this equation shown here, takes into account our required battery capacity as well as our actual battery capacity to see if we are below 80% depth of discharge as per our requirement. And we are at 78.7% depth of discharge. Therefore, we find this requirement to be numerically validated. In order to maintain upward flight, we must have a vertical component of the thrust that is greater than the weight pushing down on the platform uh, for a given angle of roll or pitch, which is theta. And using a factor of safety of 1.5 after summing the forces, we can calculate theta and we get a required roll and pitch angle of plus or minus 32 degrees. The flight controller we will be using is the PixHawk and it is equipped with an NPU 6000 uh, accelerometer and gyroscope which has a sensitivity of 0 .008 degrees per second for any uh, rotation range within plus or minus 250 degrees per second. Since the platform will be ascending, descending, loitering, and only using maneuvers in order to level itself, we find that this range is adequate for our purposes and therefore numerically validated. Our communication range requirement was generated by finding the max possible distance the platform would be from the mission control station during a mission. Using the max horizontal and vertical distances shown here, we can calculate using the Pythagorean theorem the max transmit distance, which by adding a factor of safety of 1.5 gives us a new required transmit distance of 212 meters. We found this factor of safety to be justified due to what, uh, what we are allotted to use at the school. We will be using a 3DR radio V2 uh, transceiver set provided by Dr. Davis that has an advertised range of 300 meters, as well as a Spectrum DX6 paired with a AR610 receiver, which has an advertised range of 1600 meters, courtesy of the UAS lab. And shown in this figure, both of these, even the smallest one, is over our requirement. Therefore, we find it is numerically validated. In summary, these are all of our requirements. And these are the <coughs> corresponding uh, validation numbers that we find numerically validated. At this time, I would like to invite Matthew Viss to discuss the payload subsystem definition.
Thank you, Jeffrey. My name is Matthew Biss, and I will be discussing the payload subsystem definition. Starting off, the other members of the payload subsystem consist of Jason Lockberry and Cheryl Hyman. Now to go over the two requirements of the payload subsystem, we have the first requirement, which is that each payload shall have a mass of no greater than two kilograms. And the second requirement, that each payload shall not experience an impact force of greater than 96.5 newtons. That 96.5 newtons was determined to be the breaking point of the project box I'll be discussing here soon. And as such, validating this requirement does help to support the overall subsystem objective of payload survivability. Looking back at the system level, as Andrew described previously, the payloads are shown in orange, and we have two configurations, a video payload and a non-video payload. There are a total of two video payloads and three non-video payloads for a combined total of three independent payloads, or five independent payloads, sorry. Um, taking a little bit of a closer look at a video configuration payload, we have a project box that is made out of ABS plastic to contain most of the elements of the individual payload. We have the ESD insulation foam that helps fill in some of the gaps while simultaneously protecting the electronics from any electrostatic discharge and cushioning them from a little bit of impact force. We have the atmospheric sensor port, which opens up the atmospheric pressure and temperature sensors to the ambient atmosphere so they can accurately measure the surrounding atmosphere. And we have the viewing port, which allows the video camera to stay safely contained within the, within the payload project box while simultaneously allowing it to see outside and take a very good video of the mission. We have the parachute attachment point, which the parachute that is not displayed in this rendering will attach to, and the parachute detainment strap, which will hold the parachute in place during ascent and loitering time so that it does not interfere with the rest of the platform. And then upon deployment, the parachute detainment strap will open up and allow the parachute to inflate, slowing the descent of the payloads on their way back down to Earth. Taking a closer look at some of the individual elements of a video payload, we have the parachute attachment point that I previously described that has a plate both on the outside and inside of the project box to help disperse the load of the parachute inflation. We have the video camera, which is a GoPro Hero 4 session that has been graciously lent to us by Dr. Sam Seward. We have the onboard computer, which is a TI launchpad, an interface board, which is a custom printed PCB that will be manufactured here on campus. We have a sensor board, which is a TNC prop shield, a micro SD card breakout so that we can directly interface with a micro SD card as our primary data storage. And of course, the batteries to power all of the electronics. The non-video configuration of the payloads is very similar to the two slides that you just saw, minus, of course, the video camera and the viewing port. Otherwise, all of the components are the same. I would now like to invite Jason Lathbury up to discuss the payload subsystem numerical validation. Thank you, Matthew. As stated, my name is Jason Lathbury, and today I'll be discussing the numerical validation for the payload subsystem. We investigated five design metrics, being power consumption, data storage, total payload mass, descent velocity, and expected impact forces. Starting off with the power consumption analysis, we use the equation you can see there, where Q is the electric charge in milliamp hours, I is the current in milliamps, and T is the time in hours. Here you have a table of each component requiring power from the onboard batteries within the payload, their, current, their required current, as well as the duration of the mission. Summing up the total required charge for each component gives us a total required charge of 60.05 milliamp hours. For the payloads, we chose a power source of three alkaline AA batteries, each with a voltage of 1.5 volts, giving us a total of 4.5 volts. This is within the required range to operate not only the onboard computer, but all of the sensors as well. With these batteries, we have a total electric charge of 2,200 milliamp hours. For the duration of the 20 minute mission, that gives us a depth of discharge of 2.73%, meaning that we have quite a bit of excess power, should we need it. Moving on to data storage analysis, we use the equation you can see there where D is the data collected in bytes, BPS is the bytes per sample, F is the collection frequency in samples per second, and F is the collection time in seconds. Here you have a table of each component that will be collecting data with listing their, the number of bytes that they will collect per sample, how many samples they will be taking per second, and the duration of the mission. Summing all of this together, you get 3,888,000 bytes needing to be stored on the payload. Now the payloads have two storage methods, 
for redundancy's sake. The primary storage will be a two gigabyte micro SD card. This was chosen for its ease of interface with commercially available electronics. The secondary storage will be the embedded eight megabyte flash memory on the Teensy Pop Shield. As you can see, we are only using 0.18% of the SD card and 46.35% of the embedded memory. Both of these give us a large excess capacity should we need it. Moving on to payload mass analysis, this is a table of each component within the payload itself. Summing them up, you get a total payload mass for the video payload to be 417 grams. Whereas for the non-video payload, you only have 343 grams. Using that number, we then calculate descent velocity using the equation you can see there, where D is the diameter of the parachute, which the parachute that we chose was a top flight recovery, 18-inch standard parachute. This is a commercially available hobbyist rocket parachute. Uh, M is the mass of the payload in kilograms. We use the gravitational acceleration. CV is the drag coefficient of the parachute, which was uh, supplied to us by the actual manufacturer. V is the descent velocity which we are solving for and grows the air density. Using all of the data for our given payloads, we have a descent velocity for the video payload of eight meters per second and for the non-video payload of 7.26 meters per second. Taking this information, we then calculated an expected impact force, where F is the impact force itself, M is the mass of the payload, V is the descent velocity at impact, which we just calculated, and delta T is the duration of impact. Again, putting in the information for each payload, we have an expected impact force for the video payload of 13.76 newtons, for the non-video payload, 10.26 newtons. Looking back for each requirement, both payloads are well below the two kilogram maximum limit, and both payloads have an expected impact force well below the 96.5 newtons. Therefore, numerically validating both requirements. I'd now like to invite Jessica Jansen up to do the structure subsystem definition. Thank you, Jason. My name is Jessica Jansen, and I will be covering the structure subsystem definition. First, the structure subsystem team members are the same as that on the integration team. That is myself, Adam Case, and Samantha Watson. The structure subsystem has one requirement, and that is that the structure shall withstand a load of two Gs. This is the maximum G loading we expect to experience upon landing. Shown here is an image of the structure subsystem alone. It has four components. The first is the ring where the propulsion subsystem will be housed. You can see the, lo the location of the motors and the blades by that slot in the ring. There are six of these and the motors will be attached to it via a motor plate that will be welded to these locations. The second component is the legs. There are four of these and they are placed equidistant along the, the perimeter of the ring. You notice on the bottom of them, there is a black rubber stopper. This is to decrease the amount of force experienced by the system upon landing. The third component of the structure subsystem is the electronics bars. These are square tubes and there are two of them to decrease the weight of them while still being able to sustain the weight of the electronic subsystem. The final component is the payload bar and this will house both the payloads and their deployment system. All of these components will be made of 6061 T6 aluminum and will be welded together. Shown here is the first component. The ring has a diameter of 1.02 meters and a cross-sectional diameter of 2.54 centimeters with a wall thickness of 0.16 centimeters. All four of our components have that same wall thickness. The second component are the legs. There are four of these, as I stated previously, and they have a length of 27.94 centimeters. Their cross-sectional dimensions are the same as that of the ring. The third component, the electronics bars, are square tubes with cross-sectional uh, dimensions of 1.27 centimeters by 1.27 centimeters and an overall length of 1.07 meters. This allows them to overlap on either side of the ring so that we can weld it on both sides. 
And finally, the payload bar. This also has a length of 1.07 meters so that we can weld it on both sides and has the same width as the electronics bars. It, however, has a, a height that is half that. It is 0 0.635 centimeters. I'd now like to invite Samantha Watson up to discuss our subsystem numerical validation. As Jessica mentioned, my name is Samantha Watson, and I will be covering the structure, subsystem, numerical validation. First listed here are the metrics that we use the, to generate the dimensions for each of the components of our subsystem. They are as follows, the area moment of inertia over height, the area moment of inertia over diameter, the area moment of inertia due to buckling, as well as the area moment of the area due to shear, the area and the area due to compression. It is important to note that all the calculations we made for our dimensions take into account our 2G loading as well as a factor of safety of 1.5. And all of our dimensions were generated with MATLAB and had finite element analysis performed on them with Kansas. The first two components I will be discussing with you today are the, el the electronic bars and the payload bars. Because they follow the same processes, I will be discussing them at the same time. So the first metric that we use to create these dimensions are the area moment of inertia over height, which is denoted by this equation here, where m naught is the maximum bending moment each bar will each bar will be placed under, as well as sig sigma ultimate is the maximum tensile strength of our chosen aluminum. With this equation, we were able to calculate the electronics bar minimum I over H value of 0 0.040 centimeters to the third. And the payload bar has a minimum I over H value of 0 0.017 centimeters to the third. The second metric we use to create the dimensions for the electronics and payload bar is the area of D2 shear, where V max is the maximum shear force each bar will experience and the ultimate shear strength is denoted by tau ultimate in the equation above as well. With this equation, we calculated the minimum area for the electronics bar to be 0.003 centimeters cubed, and the payload bar has a minimum area of 0.002 centimeters squared. With these two design metrics, we were able to create a matrices within MATLAB to find a corresponding minimum inertia, minimum area moment of inertia over H value that would then give us the smallest cross-sectional area to decrease our weight. As seen here, the minimum value for the electronics bar is 0 0.046. And for the payload bar, the same process was achieved and we received a value of 0 0.018. This gave us dimensions for the electronics bar of 0 0.16 centimeters for the thickness and a height and width that are the same value of 1.27 centimeters. And from here in this table, we can see that the minimum required values are less than the chosen design values. Therefore, the electronics bar is numerically validated with MATLAB. The payload bar having the same thickness and width as the electronics bar only differs by height, and the height is 0 0.635 centimeters. And following the same table as previously, the minimum required values are much less then the chosen design values, therefore the payload bar dimensions is numerically validated with MATLAB. Moving into ANSYS, we then took these dimensions and created a full-scale model in ANSYS to perform our finite element analysis. We used three different types of meshing that all converge to the same solution. The first shown here is the coarse mesh that has an element unit length of 5.08 centimeters. The medium mesh has a element length of 2.54 centimeters and the fine mesh has an element length of 0 0.635 centimeters. The battery conditions and forces for the electronics bar are shown above, where the batteries are the main forces, are the main forces in the center of the bar placing equal distance apart, and the battery conditions are fixed fixed, which will represent the weld that we will attach the electronics bar to the ring. Following the same process, the boundary conditions are the same for the payloads bar where the boundary conditions are fixed fixed as well. And the payloads are placed another equal distance apart from each other as seen in the figure above. After running our simulation, we found that the electronics bar had a maximum deflection in the center of the bar of 0.44 centimeters. 
Following saying the payload bar had a maximum deflection in the center of the bar as well of 1.06 centimeters. The maximum stress experienced by the electronics bar was 46 megapascals, which occurred at the fixed fixed location where the weld will occur. And the payload bar had the same output where the payload bar had the same outcome of having the max stress occur at the ends of the bar with a max stress of 68 megapascals. Now, see in here, for the electronics bar, the yield values determined for our system are greater than the values that were given to us by ANSYS. Therefore, the electronics bar is fully numerically validated, as well as the payload bar yield values are greater than the values calculated by ANSYS, so the payload bar is also fully numerically validated. I dial it in by Adam Case to continue the structure subsystem numerical validation. All right, thank you, Samantha. As Samantha stated, my name is Adam Case, and I'll be continuing the structured subsystem numerical validation. Now, the third component that was analyzed and the dimensions were determined was the light component. The first design metric used to determine the light dimensions was the area due to compression, where using the following equation, where F max is the maximum force that the light will experience, and sigma ultimate is the ultimate compressile strength, compressive strength of the chosen aluminum, a minimum cross-sectional area of 0.022 centimeters squared was found. The second design metric used in order to determine the leg dimensions was the area moment of inertia due to buckling, where again the equation shown above is the maximum force that the leg will experience, k is the coefficient of effective length, L is the length of the leg, and E is the modulus of elasticity of the chosen aluminum. This resulted in a minimum area moment of inertia of 2.43 times 10 to the negative fifth centimeters to the fourth. The final design metric used in order to determine the leg dimensions was the minimum area moment of inertia divided by diameter, or I over D. This is the same equation used in order to determine the dimensions for the payload bar and electronics bar. This resulted in a minimum I over D value of 0 0.307 centimeters cubed. By varying possible leg cross-section dimensions for diameter and thickness, the following table was developed where all the zero values are any of the cross-sections that did not meet any of the design metrics. This resulted in a a cross-section chosen to have a corresponding area moment of inertia of 0 0.846 centimeters to the fourth. This resulted in a cross-section with a thickness of 0 0.16 centimeters and a diameter of 2.54 centimeters. Comparing the minimum values to the chosen design values, the minimum required values are less than the chosen design values, therefore numerically validating the leg. The ring was chosen to have a radius of 50.8 centimeters with a tube diameter of 2.54 centimeters and a tube thickness of 0.18 centimeters. These were based on propulsion subsystem requirements as well as the manufacturing capabilities here at Embry-Riddle of easily acquirable aluminum tubing. The ring was then modeled in ANSYS with a coarse, medium, and fine mesh using the same element lengths used for the electronics and payloads bar. Here are the forces and boundary conditions to apply to the ring to simulate takeoff, where the electronics and payloads bars are fixed here and here, and then the thrust provided by the propulsion subsystem and weight due to the legs is shown. After running the simulation, the leg experiences a max deflection of 0 0.45 centimeters and a max stress of 28 megapascals occurring near the electronics bar's connections. The yield values of the, that were determined for the ring compared to the numbers generated from MATLAB are greater than the numbers generated from MATLAB, therefore numerically validating the ring. I would now like to pass it off to Eugene Kim, who would go over who's going to go over the system numerical validation. Thanks, Adam. 
As Adam stated, my name is Eugene Kim, and I will be covering our system numerical validation. Based off of the numerical validations of the requirements presented, our system objectives have been satisfied. The platform being capable of deploying five payloads from an altitude greater than 100 meters, as well as loitering at a specified altitude with and without payloads, is satisfied based off of there being five payloads and having a thrust weight ratio of 1.5 or greater. The platform, excuse me, the yeah, the platform will be capable of landing safely both with and without payloads are satisfied based off of the platform having a thrust to weight of 1.5 or greater and being able to withstand a load of up to two Gs. Each payload being able to collect acceleration, air temperature, and uh, video data are satisfied based off of having a data collection rate of less than 100 hertz. Each payload being capable of landing safely after being deployed and without being deployed from the platform are, are satisfied based off of the validation of having an impact uh, no greater than 96.5 newtons. The mass of each payload being less than two kilograms is satisfied based off of the system requirement of having each payload being less than two kilograms and a duration, uh, mission duration of less than, of greater than 20 minutes is satisfied based off of the numerical validation that the mission duration shall be greater than 20 minutes. Uh, finally, the platform being capable of accepting commands from a mission control station is satisfied based off the requirement that the mission control station uh, is able to transmit a distance of 212 meters away. At this point, I'd like to invite Garrett back up to begin wrapping up our presentation. Thanks, Eugene. I'd now like to cover some programmatics and wrap everything up with a quick summary. So a quick breakdown of the budget for Hades. We have allocated $1,500 for this project. Most of the budget goes to our subsystems with structures and integration receiving $100 of that budget. Propulsion receiving $100 as well. The electronics subsystem receiving $500 of our budget. The payload subsystem receiving $350. Now we've also allocated $150 for shipping and taxes, uh, taxes that we may incur from purchasing our materials. We've also allocated $150 as an emergency fund in case we break any components during our testing phase or we need to purchase additional unforeseen materials. We've also allocated $50 to a preliminary and detailed design mockup, which has gone into making platforms such as this or mockups such as this seen before you. We also have $50 allocated to program administration for the purchasing of materials for binding as well as um, our posters. Here's a quick breakdown of our labor hours. As of right now, we have 2,539 hours between our 13 team members. In quick summary, we discussed our design team structure. I then gave you the introduction of Hades. We covered our system definition and each of our subsystems presented our numerical validations to you. We then covered our system validation as a whole, and I talked about our programmatics. Here are some of the references that we utilized in order to aid us with the design process, and we would like to acknowledge all of these individuals, in particular, Dr. Benavides for assisting us with the design process, and Dr. McElwain for helping us with our documentation. We'd also like to acknowledge all of these individuals on this slide, as well as all of our panel members and everyone who came to watch our presentations today. Are there any questions at this time? Another great presentation. Uh, I was just telling Dr. B that it's uh, harder for me not to come back uh, for the details semester. So I'll definitely be seeing me again. Um, is it definitely good at explaining? Because uh, I'm fascinated about the structures and was it for the longest time I was like, oh, I got a question about the deflection of the ring because I'm curious. And then bam, it just threw it. It's like, oh, it's at 0.45. So, I mean, just because of that deflection, I mean, work with your tune structures of propulsion, just make sure that doesn't throw anything off, and because you don't want to go crashing or hitting someone's vehicle or anything. <laughs> um, also, I, mean, uh, I know maybe just uh, for the audience that you're explaining some of the equations and 
Um, yeah, talk to just a recommendation. Just talk to it a little bit because we already listed up there what the variables are. But again, for the sake of your audience. Um, also, I just want a clarification on the Anchorage. Uh, I forgot who was sitting in. Um, but so you're uh, saying that, okay, the, this will be able to satisfy um, takeoff and landing. But what about like the burning, like, was it the, the line to burn the, pit, the payload so they'll attach? I mean, is that coming for Is that just small amperage that is negligible almost? Uh, at this time, I'd like to pass this question off to Jeffrey Hughes. So in the simulation, we did run the burn wire as well as the propulsion system and all the other electronic components. We calculated that 37.75 amp hours in our simulation. So it did take into account the, the burn wires, as, as you asked. OK. So that was just clarification. And the payloads that you're going to be testing with uh, using ABS plastic? So, OK. Um, I don't know. It's been a while since I've been here. I don't know if the cost went down greatly. But uh, have you guys looked at them? Uh, at this time, I would like to pass this question off to Matthew Biz. Yes, the payloads are actually being bought as a project box, um, so we're not 3D printing them on campus. That would cost a lot more, okay. um, but we're buying them. They're not too expensive offline. Oh, okay. And then, uh, was it slide 49? Just want to see the visual. Um, okay, the plates there where you have the parachute attachment. Uh, good because uh, in my experimental space systems, I should have done that with uh, my project. <laughs> and, uh, Con Connor would remember that because we lost our camera image. <laughs> so that, I just want to say that's good. And, yeah, again, uh, nice job, guys. Thank you. Okay, very good job, and uh, I I like this slide. It points out all the components, and I think it'll be. Um, at the beginning, you have a slide nine. If if you could do the same thing for that, that will be, well, or maybe the other one, showing the entire system, if you can point out the, the important components, that would help too. Um, also, I like how the presenters spoke very clearly it, uh, in, in a very calming tone. That was really good. And in one of the slides, you sh I think it's the payload slide that you showed that you use ESD installation foam, and that was, I don't know whose idea was that, was pretty good. I, that was safe. Yeah, that was really good. Um, and also use a, a number of Katia pictures for this presentation. It helps the audience. Definitely helps me. Um, some uh, improvements I would uh, suggest is uh, in some of the requirements ver verification tables, um, it, they just list the numbers. They don't have a short description of what kind of requirements they are. Um, at that time, I had already forgotten which number corresponds to which requirement, so it probably would help if you list some words on it. Let's see. Oh, uh, last one, just a question. Uh, slide 66. I am curious about the slots. Uh, those are slots in the tube, in, in the hollow tube, right? That is correct. Yeah. Uh, so have you ever done any analysis for that? Is that the motor underneath underneath the propellers? Yes, the, uh, so over here is the... For the mounting part, because it spins, I assume it spins really fast. Have you ever done a dynamics analysis or a stress analysis on that when it spins? Uh, at this time, we have not looked into dynamics analysis of the actual uh, torque from the motor on the platform. It's the motor plate itself. Okay. Well, uh, it's probably something good con to consider. It, it just relates to uh, very recent tests uh, related to my work that they raised that question. And, uh, and our stress guys, like, uh, it's beyond his scope because it involves dynamics. So I see some similar uh, similarity. I wanted to see how you guys can handle this. We will definitely look forward, uh, work on that in the future. All right, thank you. Hi, so good, very good work. A um, couple of questions about the calculation you did on slide 25 and 26. Do you use the coefficient CPCT to get the, the power coefficient and the thrust coefficient? Where, uh, 
did you get those numbers from? Because those numbers are yet affecting all your simulations. Uh, at this time, I would like to pass that question off to Matthew Boyle. Uh, we found those equations from the uh, study done by the University of Illinois. Uh, go Lennox. Uh, and this was, uh, they used a program that was uh, made by NASA, so that's why we trusted these values. And it was specifically for an 18 by 5.5 uh, battery. Uh, does that answer your question? Oh, absolutely. It would be nice to see the citation of this slide. Okay. Because that's very important. And uh, for your information, Dr. Traub has his own program to do these calculations. So you may want to speak to that. <laughs> <laughs> into that as well. Yeah. Um, now, if you look into the FCC and FAA uh, uh, regulation to fly uh, this huge UAS, Yes, we have. Uh, the FAA regulations state that a platform that weighs more than 55 pounds cannot be flown by a hobbyist group. Uh, since we are a senior capstone project, um, under the school we are classified as a hobbyist group, which limits our altitude to 122 meters, which is roughly 400 feet, and a um, massive uh, 55 pounds. Yes. Very good, very good. Um, now, what part of the control loop is going to be autonomous and what part is going to be manual. In a sense, do you have a, I don't remember what autopilot you're using, but uh, how you're trying to manage between the ground station RC control and actually altitude stabilization for payload deployment and uh, this kind of operation. At this time, I'd like to pass this question off to um, Jeffrey Hughes. So we do intend to be autonomously flying. However, we do want to utilize manual control in order to tune the gains. It was recommended to us by Dr. Davis that it's quite difficult to tune the gains and it can take many hours. And uh, unless we use manual flight control, there's a very good chance that we may accidentally damage our platform just trying to tune it off right off the bat. Uh, also, in the event that the platform, we do not plan on this, but if it were to leave the operational cylinder and it was out of control, we would take manual control of it in order to bring it back down to the, bring it back down to the ground as soon as possible. Um, then on slide, uh, that's very good, thank you. <laughs> on slide 34, uh, uh, you have a schematic of your electronics. Do you have any voltage control? Because I've seen a lot of amperage for batteries and so on, but you have so many components and you never spoke about voltage of all the different components how you are planning to regulate the voltage. At this time I'd like to pass this to Jessica Tercius. Thank you. So the uh, highest voltage that we'll need to be running at is for the motors. Each of those run at 22.2 voltage. That's a nominal voltage. Uh, so that will go straight from the batteries to the ESCs. Um, on the ESCs there's a BEC which limits the voltage to 5 volts. So then the flight controller will be connected to the ESCs to get that lower voltage and then most of the other components will also be connected to the flight, to get power through the flight controller. So the flight controller has enough power to power for the GPS, transceiver, receiver, microcontroller? Uh, the microcontroller will have a separate power source, it will be powered by a 9 volt battery, uh, but everything else, is, the flight controller is designed to be able to handle the power requirements for those components. Yeah, so perhaps you can do a separate schematic for the power distribution. Mm -hmm. yeah, we'll and finally, on the final element analysis, this was the best uh, final element analysis I've seen today. This said, I have a couple of questions. Uh, if you go on slide 90, uh, 95, because you did quite a good final element analysis, I'm wondering how are the legs here considered as boundary conditions? At this time, I'd like to pass this to Adam Case. So the legs aren't considered boundary conditions. What is pointed out is the small, small force due to the weight of the actual legs. Oh, excellent. So yeah. I, 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 would, I would add those information, like the magnitude of all those forces on this, so people have a sense of what are the values of the forces. Uh, the second thing is, in the, in the mesh that you created, there are no slots. And the, you do have the slots, and the slots are on the most critical surface because it's upper surface where you have compressive stress, and so they are reducing the cross-sectional area of your um, of your of your uh, tubular ring. Mm -hmm. I would expect so actually to see uh, yes, I would expect to see the maximum stresses in those those locations. 
because uh, they are sharp, so they have stress concentrators, plus you decrease the cross-section area, cross-sectional area of your tubular section. So that would be nice to see an actual finite element analysis of the actual shape of the component. Okay. That would be interesting to see where the stress are going to be. And finally, on the maximum stress, 241 megapascal, what material is this? This is aluminum 6061 T6. Okay, so it's very high for an aluminum alloy. So, I mean, I, I guess you did some research on that. Yeah. So uh, the slide after the maximum stress. Yeah, right here. Uh, comparing the yield values of, alum of the, the aluminum to the values from ANSYS, it is. Is any way that is lower? I, I yeah. saw that. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. that's I the excitation where that value is coming from. Because usually okay. you see like 90, 60, 60 lines, like 90. It's still okay, but yeah. it would be interesting to know what material is. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. Very, very good job. Um, so, slide 11. I guess um, you kind of already touched this, but I had a question about just the control system in general. Um, if it knows its height and its location, so you have it going straight up, you know, against the wind, so does it know its location and its height? And then the follow-up is is the opposite of what he asked: is if you lose connection with it, you know, what does the automated flight system do uh, when it's not receiving anything? If something goes wrong there. So as of right now, uh, once we lose connection with the system, it will keep track of where it is in uh, relative position to its ground station. If it approaches anywhere near that 25 meter radius that we have defined for it, it will automatically return back to its ground station. Okay. Um, and then slide 90. I just had a question. So I think this is the, the bending analysis on the leg. Um, so I'm wondering uh, what, what M is here and kind of what load condition generated bending in the leg. I'd like to pass that off to Adam, please. All right, so the M is the maximum moment that we expect the leg to experience. And that is assuming that the entire system wants to land on that leg itself uh, okay. without falling over. So if it is a land, then come back. OK, thank you. Yeah. <coughs> All right, I'm pretty short this time. Um, well done, you guys. Good presentation. It seemed pretty solid and well rounded to me. Uh, quickly go over some things I liked. On, uh, early on, slide four, slide six. Uh, I like the configuration management. I like that the requirements were up front. That was good. Uh, also, on, let's see. Go to slide 21. Kind of the same deal as uh, with the other team that was that had a quadcopter. If you're going to use uh, a hardened ceramic uh, propeller for testing, reconsider using wood. You guys are just going straight up, so you're probably okay with that ceramic for your actual tests, but when you're just testing it, like revving up the motors, and you don't know really what it's going to do, I would consider a softer propeller for those. If I may ask a question? Yep. Um, currently, the propellers we have chosen are 18-inch carbon fiber propellers. Um, what would you recommend? Would you recommend the same uh, analysis done with that or looking into uh, wooden propellers, um, even though we're utilizing the carbon fiber ones? The short answer is yes, I would highly recommend looking at wood. As for what kind, I don't really remember what's on the market. So I don't feel like I can answer that particularly well. As for analysis, to be honest, I don't know where I would start other than just a baseline. It needs to break before whatever it could hit breaks. Um, right. Most of what I'm thinking of is like if it runs into someone's leg or if it runs into a blast shield or something like that, it's not coming through it. Because um, those retarded ceramics, I don't know if it could come through like the blast shield we have, but it could definitely throw a shrapnel. I mean, they're, like I said, they're impressive. So it's just a, it's just a safety concern of mine after seeing it just rip through an airplane. So you saw the Um Slide 55, please. This is good, having all this information, showing the methodology. I mean, it was very in-depth. It was, as I said earlier, it was almost too much information. It's very good to have, because once you have too much, it's easy to take it out. Um, Slide 73, please. 
This is also very good to show your method, show, your, show what things mean, and then show your final answer. Uh, that's very professional in my opinion. Uh, slide 78, please. Writing multiple sims was excellent. I'm surprised you guys had the time to do it. Um, but that, that's very good. And showing that they converge is also excellent. Uh, the only other, only other question I have is, what lessons did you guys learn from this? Uh, so some of the lessons that we learned from this is, um, I feel like some of them are very obvious at this point, is uh, team communication is critical. Uh, I also learned that a lack of communication between subsystems can cause uh, frustrations very easily. Um, but we have uh, also discovered how to fix those problems and move forward uh, from any issues that we have had. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I was just wondering, because you didn't have a slide on it, um, just kind of generally what there were, and I, I mean, I'm willing to open up that to any of you guys, if any of you guys want, like there's something very specific. I'd like to have Matthew go uh, answer on this as well. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the things that I learned is that being present for multiple presentations instead of just this one throughout the semester is very helpful. Um, and that doing the simulations in ways like Excel and MATLAB is really helpful because there's a lot of design iterations, so doing it by hand and having to completely redo it for one small change takes a lot of time versus investing the upfront time in Excel or MATLAB and being able to just change a number and hit run again and have all your answers out. That's really helpful. Just on a quick note on that, it's always good though to have one hand calculation in your back pocket. So if someone asks, what if your calculations are wrong? You can pull that out and say, no, I think it's right. Thank you. All right, so other lessons learned. Well done, you guys. Look forward to seeing this come spring. Thank you very much.